Yes, hello everyone. My name is Tajuddin and I'm the call host for today. I have Pauline and Shion that will be that will be coordinating the session with. So as usual, <clears throat> OLS has a code of conduct that applies to this call and any other call we have. If you witness or experience any unacceptable behavior, kindly report by sending email to teams at weareols.org or report it to individual organizer um, by sending email to individually to Berenice or Malvika or you or myself at weareols.org. Um, Shewan has written in the chat that you should kindly um, add a W or an S dash E N O dash F R O dash E S slash F R to indicate your preference for the breakout room. We are going to have breakout um room um later on in the call. Um, this is Open Science Garden Two, and I'll call on Malvika to give us the first highlight where we are in the journey of the Open Six. Thank you, Taj. Welcome, everyone. Very good to see you. Um, I am going to give you a very quick rundown on where you are and give yourself some kudos because you have really made it really far into open seats. So, um, of course, the DRA community started uh, slightly late, but they have really caught up on our Open Science Garden 1 and uh, Committee Management 1, which happened uh, two weeks ago. Today, we're gonna co cover Open Science Garden 2. And um, as you all would remember, hopefully you do remember, the by garden, we, we mean that there are multiple practices, multiple streams of uh, thoughts and ideas and aspects of science that we all work on. In the past call, we've covered some of the aspects around open science infrastructure. Um, we also had a couple more sessions, which I can't remember right now. But today we will be talking about uh, evaluation, review and evaluation. Godwin is here from eLife and we are very excited to listen uh, about that aspect of open science. We have Scientica who will be talking about open source software and we will have Sohail talking about open access publication. Um, so open access publication, open evaluation and open source software. So with that, if you have any questions specifically around this garden topics, please do ask me now before I pass it to Touch. Great, you all are oriented. Back to you, Touch. Yes, um, thank you very much. So with that, I will call on Godwin with the first presentation on open evaluation and open review. Thank you. I, I understand I have 10 minutes, right? Uh, yes, 10 minutes, but you do have a couple of more minutes for question. And then we have additional two minutes because we have started early. Great, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I'm sharing my screen now. Can you see properly? Yes. Thank you. So I've been asked to discuss this and I'm going to try to keep the time. Um, so we're going to overrun. Um, open peer review and research evaluation. So um, this is just going to be a quick tour. Uh, if you have questions, you can ask uh, at the end. Uh, this is just a very short uh, summary definition of what we're talking about. So these are uh, open peer review and re research evaluations. They are approaches that help with dissemination and critiquing uh, research outputs in a more uh, transparent way. Uh, that's the short and simple. And this uh, slide is also shared. Uh, I, I suppose Tajid didn't probably send it out to everyone uh, later. But for open peer review, it's about changing the traditional system. Uh, of course, many of you probably know that the traditional system is you submit your articles, uh, a few people look at it, uh, do something with it, and, and that's it. And they would give a mark for approval to it. Uh, if you know about eLife and everything going on now, there's an argument about that because eLife has changed our peer review system, and that is all part of being open and transparent. So 
the, the modern way or the open practice is to make sure that peer review is more open and that everyone knows what is happening. And as well, people or the, the, the readers can see those reviews that happened at the end. So the characteristics of it is that there is identity disclosure. I put that there because that's actually more controversial uh, from the engagement I have with uh, especially early career researchers from across the world. There's mixed approach to it. Uh, a lot of researchers don't want to put their name, especially when they're early career, don't want to put their um, name on uh, reviews that they've written. And we know the reason for that is because of the fear of repercussions and many other uh, outcomes that can uh, um, emanate from that. But then that is part of the open uh, peer review system. It hasn't really uh, gathered enough steam. A lot of people are doing it. A lot of people don't want to do it for certain reasons. Then there's transparency. The process has to be transparent. And by transparent, you mean the authors know what is going on. They are involved with the editors and reviewers as well. Community involvement is always very key to it. Uh, the other aspect of it is, is also that these reviews can happen on preprints, not just on submitted articles. So preprints are a key part of open uh, science system. So on preprint servers, uh, uh, other uh, commenters can either review articles, um, and I'll get to some of those uh, things happening already, as well as author engagement. So there are some advantages to it. Um, I'm not going to talk about this advantage because I don't I don't think there is one where there are there, of course there are. So there's advantages, it encourages accountability. It helps you to uh, hopefully eliminate bias uh, if that is possible, but we hope it's doing that. It's better than the um, traditional system because it achieves that to some certain level. Uh, it improves trust in the process uh, because the authors are involved, because readers can see what the review, what uh, the peer review was, they can have more trust on the uh, uh, research output. Uh, you can see the views of those who review, review the article. So it improves that uh, trust. Constructive feedback is a key part of this system uh, because when the peer review is happening, whether it is on an article that is submitted through the a journal system or an article that is posted on a uh, preprint review, there is openness to it. There is con constructive engagement um, in that. And it could hopefully result to faster feedback and uh, also all of this means that it can be collaborative. So there are some challenges with it. Uh, some, uh, you know, some of the, the organizations that are still doing uh, traditional review would say that there is a lot of uh, difficulties in changing their systems, uh, either because of the infrastructure they use or whatever process they use. So those seem to be the excuses that we get. Uh, but also, I think from one aspect, it's just the reluctance to take on this uh, process of openness because it could eventually reveal things that people hadn't realized were there before, or it could lead to more questions being asked. But at the end of the day, uh, change is not easy. So there is that barrier. There's the fear of criticism and threats, you know, that can come from it and also potential to uh, implicit bias. Now, this is very difficult to fathom because you I've said earlier that, you know, it can eliminate bias, but you could then start asking why is the uh, implicit or explicit bias uh, an issue? We can get to that if anyone has a question about that. And on research evaluation, so this also goes beyond peer review. It's then involve other aspects of the assessment of the quality and impact, and of course, reproducibility. Uh, so it, it brings more, makes it even more and more open. There is other aspects of uh, the research that's then uh, looked at beyond just the peer review, talking about peer review earlier. So preprint review, so these are the components that makes up the, this evaluation. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has been using or invo getting involved with um, preprint review. This is happening at very improved and increased level these days. Uh, it 
helps uh, the public or other researchers to look at articles that has been posted on the preprint service and either annotate them, put comments on them or full review. Uh, I think uh, one organization called Pre-Review uh, does something, they used to do something they called Rapid Pre-Review, uh, which is a set of 12 questions that you can just go through to comment on an article. And then there's a post-publication review. This is still not taken really, it hasn't really kicked off as it should. Um, it's, it's the fact that a finding shouldn't just stop once it's been journal published. There should be capacity to critique that um, output again, look at it with fresh uh, uh, understanding and make a comment on it. And of course, there are the alternate, alternate metrics that you can use. And this uh, part of it is also the newer uh, way of evaluating articles, checking you know who is reading it, how many people are using it. It's not just, uh, I think I mentioned, in life going through the, we are recently having an, a debate about impact factor. So it shouldn't just rest on impact factor alone to measure the impact of uh, a research. It's about actually who is using it, what has it achieved, what does it add to the uh, to the uh, uh, discussion, and that will be through social media and other forms of um, engagement within the within uh, out in the public. So. For research evaluation, it also helps to increase the diversity of the views that we get on research. Uh, whether we like it or not, and this is not because I'm, I'm, I'm Black, but the truth is that there's a dominance from the Western Hemisphere on the, on the voices that review uh, research outputs. But by having res um, open research evaluation, other underrepresented communities are able to contribute in their own way. By using uh, something like a preprint, you can set up a group or you can review by yourself. Most of the time, some authors, when they encounter those, they appreciate it because it, it does help them to improve and strengthen their work further. This is something that is not possible in the traditional uh, peer review system. And of course, um, this helps to uh, gather some rec um, uh, real world uh, experiences that can contribute um, into those uh, outputs rather than just the prestige of, um, what do you call them, uh, editors who sometimes has no real world experience of where the research was done. And I think uh, uh, when I have been out talking to people in other countries, visited some other institutions in countries, uh, people has thought, um, researchers have told me sometimes that they believe that the, re the reasons their uh, submissions were rejected is because they don't think the reviewers understood what they were doing. And that is true because context matters sometimes. If someone is not uh, 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 familiar with the context in which you're working uh, uh, in, then they are not going to be able to sometimes understand or comprehend how the research has come about. So that is a thing that exists. Uh, open uh, uh, research evaluation helps us to overcome those impediments. So the challenge is the equity issues can arise from uh, lack of accessibility. Now, this is about who has access and what, how do we enable access? What makes it easy for those who could not to be able to assess it? Um, it also creates quality issue. Um, that is also a, a, a thing that over time is going to improve, but it is there and has to be recognized. So the future looks like this. Uh, we all know about AI now because AI is ubiquitous, it's everywhere, everything's about AI. So I think going forward, there are big and input from a, a, AI or whoever develops them. And uh, there are a lot of training going on around these things now. Uh, if you want to take part, there's organizations like ProReview, um, I think ProReview, PreLights, they enable you as a researcher to be able to either practice, ProReview has something they call Sandbox, you can actually reach through a research do a review on it, on the sandbox. If you then wish to make it live, you can publish it um, on the pre-review website. Hypothesis helps you to annotate articles as well. And Society is uh, one that just curates all of these articles. There's Kotahi and the rest of them. So that's it. I hope I'll stay within 10 minutes, but if you have any questions, you can ask um, or 
contact me through those links. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Godwin. That was really insightful. Um, so we do have questions already. So, um, Merita, I will hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Please yeah. go ahead. I wonder how does that initiative communicate with, um, journals? You know, um, and what needs to be done for in that communication. So we we're working so hard to have that peer review and these established Q1, Q2, but then the open review is something different. And so I feel like this, there could be a competition. I don't know if that makes sense, but I wanted to hear your uh, opinion on that one. It's, a, it's an organizational or journal choice to decide whether they want to adopt open science fully or well, to some, set, to some steps. Um, in eLife, we do open, you know, open peer review. All our reviews are published um, online um, with the assessment. So you can read the review and we do side by side. You can read the review against the article. So that helps you. It's up to a journal whether, whether they take it. I think that the, like I mentioned earlier, the reason that perhaps some are not taking it, it, it takes away control. That's what you have to say. It takes away control. And most of the time, the system we live in in the world is all about control. Um, if you don't control things, then you can't make as much money from it. And the journal system is dominated by corporate uh, commercial organizations. So they don't see any benefit in being that open because then it can challenge their dominance and their control of what uh, scientists and researchers produce. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Um, Thank you for that answer. We have Vincent. Yes, thank you. Um, I really was interested in the notion of community review that you mentioned, and I'm not familiar with it, but I like the idea, but I'm a bit uh, puzzled on how it can be implemented in practice. For instance, you don't want everyone to be able to just review uh, academic papers because like, like they might not have the, the, the background to do so. So like, how is it implemented in practice? Well, I think maybe you think of community as everyone. Community is, you know, you can, communities, you can define community and attach it to a set of individuals and groups. You know, we are here now, we're a community. So that community can, and most of the time, is community of researchers. The community reviews are happening. For example, if you go on the website called Society, the one I put there, um, society.org, you see community of reviewers. There are the review commons, there's uh, uh, Gigabyte, there are Spreelite. So all of these are people who come together and decide that what they would do. For example, re review commons actually talk to the author. Uh, Collab talk to the author. There are some communities like pre-review pre do not really talk to the author. They just pick up a paper and they review it. Um, a start bio crowd review is the same thing. They pick up a paper, they review it, and then they post it online. Uh, they pick up those papers because the 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 um, authors has posted it on a preprint server. Once you post something on a preprint server, you're signaling that anyone can have access to it and use it. So that's what they are leveraging on and they post it. So this is what community review is. It's not just about anybody. And, and I like that you raised that point because that is also the argument that those who don't want to do open science sometimes say that, oh, if you put it out there, any job block can come and write something and it can be dangerous. But actually, I'm not a neuroscience. Why would I be reviewing a neuroscience paper? You know, everyone knows that people take that responsibility by themselves without even being told that. Uh, nobody will come off the street, pick up a computer, uh, let's say a computer science paper and say, well, I'm going to just say something about it. I mean, fine, you can say it, but it won't stick. So community review happens just by those who are from the same field, who have the experience, they come together and they do it. So this is why we call it community review. Maybe just a quick follow-up. Thank you very much. But uh, the links that you put at the end of your slides, are those um community reviews that are actually happening at the moment or is it like is it happening in some fields this kind of review uh, do you have access to this slide if you don't let me see if i can do this quickly um let me go back to 
if you have access, this these things has links on them, these images. So this one is one of the community review pre review. Um, on this website, they it curates uh, community reviews. Um, actually, why don't I do this this way? Um, oh, there you go. So that's pre review. So that's pre light. If I do this, you can see more communities here. So this called groups here, and you can see here. So this e life, but this is pre pre light peer community in evolution. So these are all community reviewers. Um, access microbiology. Uh, pro review, they just pick up papers and they review them, Acadia Sciences. So if you go here, you can see those sort of things. That's uh, what happens. Um, and you can read more about them from there. Was I sharing my screen? Oh, yes, I am. Um, yes. Okay, um, Vincent, do you have a follow-up question? Okay, wonderful. Um, I see a hand from Malvika. Very quick, Godwins, can you can you share with us the relevance and use of pre-registration and registered report? You don't have to go in details, but the the role of evaluation in those in those stages. So the the pre-register is. I'll be frank with you. I don't think we do that in real life yet. We don't. We don't mandate it. We encourage it. So again, you know, the thing with open science is, is quite broad. The spectrum is wide. Um, the key ones tend to be, I think the foundation is first of all, encouraging researchers to post their manuscripts. But actually, if you step back before that, the pre-registrations happen. And now reviewing or evaluating pre-registered um, pre uh, content is not common yet. Nobody's really doing that. I sense that the reason is because you don't have the full picture. This is just some components of the research that has been, you know, uh, made open. So the pre-registration is useful if, but it's not catching on quickly. Uh, my take is that the importance has been placed on the full manuscript being posted on preprint servers first, rather than on the pre-registration. Uh, speaking to researchers, they find pre-registration sometimes difficult because they say, I'm not sure yet. I haven't gathered all the data. I'm not sure if I have everything I need. So those can be an impediment for uh, uh, researchers to do pre-registration. But at that stage, uh, no, no one, as far as I know currently, is doing reviews or evaluation at that level for now. But it's very well encouraged if people want to do it. I know that some uh, journals, I think it might be Nature or Cell, does encourage it quite seriously. Um, E-Life doesn't. Uh, part of it is because uh, we don't really use a lot of mandating on things. Uh, we think people can do what they should. We make comments on the published article to say, if you need the data, you can speak to the authors, contact them through their corresponding author. But all the data that we receive as part of the submission is published, not just the article. We publish everything. So there's three components to it. There's the reviews, there's all the data, and there's the uh, research uh, write-up. We publish those. Thank you so much. I will drop a couple of links in the from a pad for folks who are exploring these. I, I haven't myself practiced a lot of those, so I really appreciate you sharing how different journals are doing it. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Malvika. We have a question from Moses. Uh, please go ahead. Sorry, I realized I was on mute. Can you hear me, please? Uh, yes. Yeah, this may be a little bit technical, but uh, it's fine if uh, um, it's fine if um, there is no specific answer to that. So I wanted to know that trying to address this traditional system of having um, papers limited to a certain group of people doing the reviewing process, um, is there a mechanism that open um, peer review journals now are using to incorporate people from diverse background or it's just a matter of looking for whosoever 
as the background to review the paper and then contact them. I just, I just, just curious about that. If there is anything like a mechanism to get that corrected. Yeah. Um, yes, um, there is mechanism. Um, <clears throat> so in a life, we have something we call the early career reviewers pool. So it's a, an open system where uh, early career researchers can apply to become reviewers. Uh, be put into a, a review reviewer pool, um, and then our editors can uh, find people through that. Um, we also try to do open calls uh, to appoint editors these days. Uh, last year, was it last year? Yes, last year, we did an open call for editors from Africa only, uh, because I think the question you're asking is leaning more into how do we address the imbalance or the underrepresentation the issue of um, equity. So this is what we are doing. Again, there's no mandate for journals to do that. People are doing so many different things, but that's from a life side of things. We are trying to stop uh, appointing editors through uh, who knows who. So the year before that, we did a call for editors from Latin America. Uh, that is also to make sure that we increase the representation from these parts of the world. But the open, uh, the early career reviewers poll is very public. Um, I, I will find the link and send to Mavic and target in later. Uh, if you want to apply, you can just simply apply to that um, and, and editors can pick from there when they need uh, reviewers. Thanks, thanks on that. Um, thank you, Moses, for the question. So um, we have another question from Sohail, and Sohail happens to be our third speaker for today. So please go ahead with the question. Sorry, yeah, I came in a bit late, but um, it sounds super, super fascinating. I just wanted to ask about the the the, the open peer review process. Like, in, to what extent is there a um? I, I see that you, um authors can respond to their um uh. For, for peer review comments and, and and that can be published but um is there any like live dialogue between um uh, reviewers and authors um have you considered this and and, and yeah what do you think yeah again it's uh, journal specific um again using the case study of uh, eLife we do that we call it a uh, collaborative or consultative review so we the reviewers and authors yeah, the reviewers and authors and the senior editor responsible meet to discuss what they feel about the paper um, and give feedback on that. So there are some uh, articles there that uh, authors has written to say how they felt through the system. Uh, it's something that we've been doing in eLife since 2019, I think. And that was before my time, before I joined eLife. Um, it's going, it's been very well received. Uh, if, if there's any part that, uh, authors uh, enjoy in with engaging in engaging with e life. It's just that that part because then not only do they get to meet and know who the reviewers are, um, they get in, engaged. They involved with them to talk about their paper and give feedback to them. Uh, however, having said all of this, you know I mentioned identity identity at the beginning. Uh, e life doesn't put names to reviewers. And the reason for that is simply, as I said, we work within an EDI uh, 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 principle of sometime equity. In, it's not about doing the same thing for everyone. It's finding what suits certain people. So we know that within our, um, within our uh, communities, there are a lot of concerns about putting their name forward because of what I mentioned earlier, the repercussions that you can have. So because of that, we decide that we use reviewer one, reviewer two, reviewer three. However, the authors actually know who the reviewers are. So it's just that it's not public. So the authors get to meet them. Um, so this is what happens with the uh, consultative peer review system. Um, thank you very much, um, Sohail and Godwin for the question and answer. I think Godwin has to go to another engagement and um, I will stay I'll, till five o'clock or okay. to the top of the hour. Yeah. Oh, thank thank you. you very much. So I would that I will call on Pauline to 
um, how and introduce our next um, speaker. Thank you very much, Godwin, once again. Great. Okay. Uh, so our next speaker uh, taking us through open, open source is uh, Santika Banik. Um, yeah. She's, uh, uh, go ahead, Santika. Sweet. I'm just trying to rearrange the screens. And I should work. Let me know when you could see a screen there. Allow all permissions given. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Lovely. So today's session, we will be discussing about uh, one of my favorite topics is how to design reproducible analytics. There's a lot of chat around how how design is one of the primal concepts to build something scalable. So today's theme would uh, the takeaway which we um, as a group could have at the end of the day is going design first and thinking open source as a medium rather than a tool. Let's dive in. Uh, I'm Santika Banik. I'm an independent data consultant and advisor. My primary role is to connect uh, small and medium-sized enterprises with the goodness of open source, making sure it's ethically utilized and it's understood and not misunderstood as free software or other jargons out there. More about me on the website with the work I do and the different uh, communities that I work with. Sweet. Let's dive into the simple equation about what reproducibility feels and means like. is the ability to rinse, repeat, and at the same time maintain trustworthy outcome. Let's dive one after one to the three keywords here. Once the original step or the procedure could be repeated with the same input and the output, does the outcome change? Is the environment in which the system was developed is trustworthy enough to have the, repeat the same or similar outcome when few of the processes are additive or subtractive in nature. Currently, I'm holding like a bunch of Lego blocks with me, like love how reproducibility and Lego blocks go hand in hand. Does these block, when I break it into two or multiple pieces, can I st stitch them together given the environment in which it was built and remains same? We'll say how uh, we could do that. There are three main puzzle pieces here. Defining your goals. If the goals or the environment in which it's, it's being populated is changing constantly and there is a lot of churn, design won't fit in. Even going design first won't work. And the third part is thinking open source as a glue, as a medium, stitching all these pieces together. These three components when done well, a good design facilitates a good reproducible framework or a procedure or simply a script that could be, again, used in a different environment and could produce the same outcome. This is uh, one of the architecture about which I came up with to understand how can we drill from having constant needs and defining our goals. What I mean by needs and goals and how it all connects at the end to the business value is needs are always changing. Um, it, they are aspirational, while goals are more on the static framework. Goals uh, are unable, but at the strength, they are static. These goals feed into the bottlenecks and the gaps. And we reevaluate goals and gaps one after one to understand if our bottlenecks are not conducive or is overloading our goal ecosystem. Either the goals pivot or we shrink the bottlenecks. These together, after we have a certain understanding, we feed it into our resource pipeline. Resources are here, the open source ecosystem, the medium, the tools that we can decide to, to build this process, the procedure. Finally, we do the implementation, documentation very hand in hand, not leaving it to the end, 
thinking someone might come in and help us do the respective. We combine, we do it continuously together as we develop. We test and learn. Whatever the learnings that we are getting in this process, we feed it to a bottlenecks. Now, the bucket of bottlenecks is, is being trained to understand that it's continuously evolving. The process is working and now I can understand where it's shifting. What are the areas I need to improve in the next iteration? So rinsing, I am repeating. And finally, I am understanding. Now I have a system that is good enough to incorporate a business value into it. And once we know or see the light at the end of the tunnel, we feed it again to our goals. The goals will be more bolder for the next iteration. And together, this, this entire principle, the entire workflow combines the idea of going design first, the idea of combining the organizational understanding, idea of combining people and processes together in the in the i in the landscape of open source left shift design thinking i think this this is one of the most underrated concept but often talked loudly about what i mean by that we love to talk about it or love to preach it like let's go design first but then when it comes to the implementation often there are roadblocks, often there are resource crunches, and often we need it in under 24 hours. Any feature, anything. So going design first requires a resource-rich environment where you have support and validation about the grid that you're going to present. Before building a huge puzzle, we need to understand what are the components the puzzle has, what are the bottlenecks that we will encounter, the design and thinking goes like it it will take around 90% of the entire resource. And finally, the 10% which is left would be helping us to build, to develop something. And the test, deploy, monitor, analysis. If the design is, is thought about very well, these are like the follow-up step which follows you. Once you beat the positive buoyancy of planning and design thinking, the other concept fall into a place. It's like a free fall. First step, done right. Second, falls into the place. Third, yes, now we have basic understanding and, and now we need to test the system. We get into the shipping of the production software and we continue to do that. The traditional method would be zero design principles, zero thinking, which leaves no room for the additive or the subtractive nature of having a reproducible software a reproducible procedure and having more detailed attention at the beginning to test and plan and design leaves the room, builds the room, those nice little gaps which could be used in like in the future or thinking X years down the line, how it might work all in together in one single cohesive system. This is another uh, incremental way of thinking about left shift design. The diagram is a little complex, but I'm just going to give a gist about how uh, it could be thought about. Given there is 100% uh, is the total amount, and then we take like 80% first iteration for the design. In that 80%, we could only do like 40% of the design, which is okay, and the rest 40 goes into the implementation. Now, Removing that 40%, which is already done in design, we take the next 40% and see, okay, now 20% would be given to the design and then the rest, again, we develop. Until the design and, and the development comes into the equation of having 50-50, uh, which is the ratio equal to one, or 500, which is ratio equal to one, we continue this cycle and rinse and repeat again until the system sp speaks fluently to each other, like design speaks to the people and, 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 and the users are able to comprehend the roadmap. Finally, all these ideas and things, I, uh, I combined it to one single framework when the slides are uh, shared, or you could also go um, to my GitHub repository and interact with this framework. This framework came into uh, existing like about two years. And I was mostly inspired by how design first thinking in the data landscape could 
could add value, could add um, could add more years to your projects, uh, years to understanding how how the shift in the way we think could also could be nurtured and could be combined into into a form of a storytelling. So Data Journey was born as a storytelling medium for me to build reproducible, scalable data pipelines, analytical solutions, and um, and I could like go ahead and and give a quick demo. But respecting the time here, um, would love to take any uh, questions that you might have. Uh, thank you, Santika. Uh, I, I'm not seeing any hands up. Um, maybe you can ask a fast question. Um, uh, your data journey model. Um, have you have you heard from Leonelli's work um, on data journeys as a framework to um, yeah uh, show. Um, difficulties when integrate like the entire data journey process how data travels uh, and interacts with people and systems Is that it? yes it, it drills down the idea about how human interaction leads to the making of solutions that makes sense if i could put in that and it doesn't have to be super complicated or elevated in 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 a lot of different ways but have to be still abstracted and leave scope for additions and deletions so this framework lets like the design of it works as such each component are very independent in their nature but they are also connected well and could interact with each other so if one component goes down or so faces certain issues the system still works but then there is also a monitoring system that drives that one is going down, needs more checkup and help, and needs a help monitoring. We go back, repeat the process, and continue. It's it's a way of telling the journey, the vehicle in which it's riding, it's gonna face some issues. We need to reevaluate, check the engine, see if the, everything is working, and continue the process. Have a quick. I have a question. Uh, just to also want, just want to contextualize. A lot of people in this room are not software developers, so um, I want to. I'm going to also remove the spotlight so I can see everybody's face. Uh, so whoever is putting spotlight, please don't. Um, so the question is, Santika, can you just share a little bit around how can people actually start engaging with open source communities? What it means to contribute to open source communities and for example, use or cite an open source software that someone else might have prepared? Open source, like contributing to open source, think open source as a landscape, as I tell. It's your garden. And how would you move around or interact with your garden? You feel, if you feel the grass, you feel the air, you feel the next step, you feel the flower. So whenever you try to enter the open source ecosystem, interact with the, interact with the people. No who are who are the humans working on the back end then you will understand the sentiments behind building that package or building that product and soon once you have that understanding and mental model start interacting with the other aspects of which could be community which could be design which could be interacting with the code or any of these or all of these all together thanks thanks antika i'm going to also drop a different set of slide deck in the chat for folks who might be very new to open source software or community so they can also get some idea around what it means to engage with github repository that are not explicitly yours uh, for example you know you are all working on ols 9 repository which is technically an open source repository so how can we apply some of some of those open source practices into our own work even if we don't see ourselves as software developers um, and yeah, thanks so much, Santika. Back to you, Pauline. Right. Uh, yes. Uh, so next, we have breakout discussions on benefits of becoming an open scientist. Um, and I'm just checking. 
with Taj if we have breakout rooms or soon? Uh, yes, so Malika is um creating the rooms and we should have that ready. So I'm just going to post the questions in the chat for the breakout room while Malvika is getting the rooms ready. I'm ready. Um, okay. to go ahead. Um, to, do you want me to explain the what we are doing in yes, breakout please. room? Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, the speakers. That definitely sets up, up sets us up for what we're going to talk about in our breakout rooms. So there are some questions that we have prepared, uh, which are to think about what are the benefits of becoming open scientist? What are the incentives to participate in science? Um, not just science, of course, anything that you are doing that you have encountered throughout your life. So the reason we're having this breakout is that by this point, you have heard about a few more practices from open source, open science, open evaluation, open infrastructure. Um, what does these mean to you? When we talk about them on a specific context, of course, we want you to think about practices and contextualize it. So these are very simple questions or, or not, depends on what you're gonna talk about in your breakout rooms. You have 15 minutes, um, I'll open the room and you have a chance to actually move around in the room. So if you feel like you've already met people in your room, absolutely fine to move out in a into a different room or if you have any question come back to the main room and we will be here to support you with that i'm opening all the room you will be back in 15 minutes um yes and i'll be pausing the recording Is people stream back in Um, right. Okay. So I hope everyone had like interesting discussions in the groups and I've seen a few notes within, um, yeah, in the Frama part, which are really good. Uh, can I ask someone from breakout room one, two, they'd like to share some of their notes? Or any other breakout rooms, we don't have to go in order. That's very okay. So if you're ready to share, just unmute yourself. Yeah. Ahmed, yes. Uh, wait, uh, uh, his hey. name is... Hey. Thank you. Yeah, um, like you can call me Shay. Thank you so much, uh, Malvika, for saying that. So we uh, actually discussed a lot about the uh, benefits of becoming uh, an open uh, or open scientist so we talked about the major effect about that so we thought that it's going to increase the collaborations a lot and that's going to be huge because collaboration make like plays an important role in any uh, scientist's life because it's going to help them to find like, more innovative ideas about their projects like gain more knowledge, like get more up to date. So that's going to be one of the things that can lead to like uh, having more collaborators can result in uh, like better teamwork and then have a, I mean, have a bigger team. And then that's going to result in like pro more promising results. And like that's the end because we want the broader impact. And that's what we really want to uh, have after doing any research so that's that's that was one thing that we discussed and about the incentives uh, so the incentives could be like the joy or the desire of uh, learning more about that science and gaining more knowledge about that and that could that could come from like different experiences like I was telling my own experience in the biomedical engineering field that most of us like had experience and have seen like one of our close uh, relatives who were suffering from a disorder and then um, they failed so we thought that okay we really need to we really want to or need to uh, do something in those fields and then using our mathematical skills and engineering skills into these areas we can like we can do uh, something that can have a broader impact and then 
open science can really uh, make it way better. So this was su a summary of what we discussed. It's a really interesting comment. Thank you so much. Um, uh, it's amazing the notes that are already in the from a pad. So if you have any more notes, just put them in there. And uh, because of time, we're going to go into our next uh, talk on open access publication. And uh, I'm going to ask Sohail to take it away. Hey, thank you so much. And I just got your message about the uh, sharing of the uh, um, slides and, and frame of pad. I will, I will give you, I'll, sh I'll send you the slides and afterwards, hopefully they will they'll be up for people to access. So very, very uh, happy and, and uh, to be here and uh, at least virtually. Um, I'm going to start sharing my slides because I'm conscious of uh, time. Um, but um, yeah, just very excited to be in, in a space like this with, with, with people who are um, so concerned about open research. Um, so can you all see my slides? Is that, is that coming up? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, brilliant. All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk. So I'm Sahara Hall. I'm, I'm, I'm a, uh, uh, a researcher, uh, educator person in um based in the uk based in imperial college london based in kicks college london i work with on migration mental health ethics uh open research um decolonizing creative methods and such and today i'm here to talk to you about our journal stolen tools uh so i'm going to um uh tell you a bit about what it is why i think it is a different to a lot of other journals out there um and shares in uh, the open research agenda that um, uh, has been talked about um, by the previous speakers and, and 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 also you guys and your contributions and uh, yeah and, and think about uh, where we're going next and where, what we want to do better because there are many many things we want to do better. So, stolen tools. What does our journal look like? I thought I'd I'd start off by saying uh, just showing you what it looks like. So, it's a anti-racist health inequalities journal. We've had um, two. Uh, two issues so far so we're very very new um and the first one looked at um the ethics of knowledge production um and uh, who gets to produce knowledge why whose knowledge we value um in in an academic and university context and beyond that and the second issue uh looked at um uh intersecting intersectionality basically in our um in in health again in knowledge production um there were some critiques of um uh sort of diversity initiatives and things like that and um we're going to be doing special issues um to try and broaden out our reach and and, and basically give opportunities for the journal to be uh taken over and um, used uh, um, in whatever way is, is, is useful by um, different different groups. So I think our, ne our next issue will be a special issue and it's a, it could be a, um, students from um, the UK have, uh, are working with students from uh, across the world to um, create a, a, a special issue of their, 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 their choosing. I think it's on anti-colonial struggle or something like this. So that's what it looks like. So why why care? Why is it relevant to the open research uh, agenda? So we've got two key aims, and that is firstly to promote the, the, the voices of um, racialized minorities. And so this involves um, a lot of different things. So firstly, we put people before papers, and what we mean by that is that we are uh, uh, we don't ask for a full manuscript to begin with. We ask for, you know, tell us who you are, what you want to write about, why you have a person to write about it. And then we pair people with mentors to develop their ideas. And um, once they're ready, and it, it, I don't, you know, some people are ready after three months, some people are ready after a year. Um, whenever that is, uh, then we submit it to an open peer review process. Um, so I was very interested to hear the previous talk, uh, um, and that's why I asked a question about the open peer review process, um, where in our version of it, you, the, there is a lot of, um, uh, you know, 
uh, dialogue with uh, the reviewers, the mentor and the mentee and about the piece. And then um, once that process has been satisfied, we, um, we, we publish. So, so hopefully, you know, that makes things easier and more open in terms of if someone wants to publish. And then we've got stuff like we've tried and reduce bureaucratic obstacles by, you know, adopting the reference your way model, you know, just, you know, suggest where the evidence is coming from, basically, um, in whatever way is, 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 is works for you. Uh, and we pay um, reviewers, uh, mentors, contributors. Um, we also pay, we have like artwork, which is commissioned based on this, is what we did in the second issue, based on the article and then the um, authors and the um, um, uh, artist can talk and then the artwork sort of evolves a bit uh, to reflect the piece properly. So there's lots of things happening and everyone's labor is, is, is at least in some way um, recognized and that is very very important um, I think for um, an open uh, research and obviously everything is accessible and, 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 and free to, to to look at so the second question is the second aim uh, which relates to the open research agenda and this uh, is um, challenging what counts as knowledge um, so the journal is supposed to provide a space for people to be uh, uh, emotionally and also politically expressive um, and there's I think a inherent sort of self-censorship within a lot of academia that's how sometimes we're trained to be as researchers unfortunately um, you know there, there's still this idea of the neutral research the neutral voice the, the um, voice that's not so emotive um, and so we're trying to challenge that um, we are uh, trying to open up um, I guess the ways in which people can share uh, knowledge. So we've had poems and fables. We've had uh, sort of thirty-page stories. We've had experiential pieces talking about a particular event and how that affected uh, someone's reflection on a particular uh, topic. We've had campaigning pieces, and we've had traditional academic pieces. We've had empirical pieces. We've had, you know, so we've had a lot wide range of pieces. And I guess that the key here is that we are trying to recognize that there are lots of different forms of knowledge that are, is valuable and should be valued and, and, and should be drawn upon uh, in, in, in uh, academia and beyond. And part of that also is by in order to challenge what counts as knowledge, we also need to uh, challenge the, the sort of related question of who gets to produce it. And so we are very much trying to reach beyond um just uh you know people who are already working in universities or studying in universities uh, and in an academic capacity um and um you know for instance as a second issue we've got a launch event and we are partnering with a um refugee charity to launch it in a community space that they use uh to try and again um you know just broaden out who gets who gets to put in input into this knowledge production process um and yeah i i, I hope that at some point we will uh, have developed a, a a model convincing enough to um uh, uh challenge other journals to, to change their practices as well um so um building for the long term so yeah there's lots of things that we uh we need to do we need to get better at uh in, in if to be more open more inclusive uh one of the bedrocks of what you know how we've been sustainable is through library partnerships because libraries often have um people focused on open research and that kind of chimes nicely with what we're trying to do and that that's um you know uh we, we're trying to build like a solidarity subscription model where we have hundreds of libraries all contributing little bits uh, of money that would otherwise have gone to you know a lancet paper or something like that um and trying to have some version of crowdsourcing, which which some journals are, uh, community-based journals are starting to to do to have independence from big profit-making publishers. Uh, we're trying to build uh, international links, um, 
uh, and 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 break out of our our UK based bubble. Obviously, if we're trying to be an, an anti race and decolonial journal, then we've got a lot of work to do uh, around that and around building meaningful partnerships uh, with, with with people across the world. So. Um, and then there's loads of other things like our open peer review process. It was so interesting listening to the first talk and thinking about how we can get better and more transparent about that. I love like having the comments there, having the previous version and new version. There's things we want to do there. We're just having a discussion about uh, language and like how can we um, do better at like at least, you know, translating into certain languages that the authors think is going to be really key audiences um opening up more mediums to contribute so we had like infographics and video uh contribution last issue as well uh, and thinking more about the mentorship pro uh, um model the model of mentorship so you know again that's why i'm also very interested in reading about this program and learning about more for, more of this program because obviously mentorship is key and there's this um you know we've had uh lots of discussions about the word mentorship is that really uh, you know does that imply some sort of power dynamic does that imply that knowledge is held with one person not with the other like how do you move towards sort of uh, a, a more meaningfully mutual model which still supports someone who has less experience of of of, of publishing i guess so loads of things we want to work on loads of ways that we can improve um and yeah hopefully we can keep going and in 10, 20 years, we'll still be still be around. That's that's the dream. Thanks. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Amazing. Um, there are actually questions in the framapod. So I'm going to just pick one and then you can I think put in the rest other answers. Uh what funding sources are there to help with cost of open access publishing? Uh so um our journal has, um, as I said, we get funding from uh, like libraries, basically. So libraries that we're, the team members are affiliated from. There's some internal pots of funding we've gone for. We're trying to get slight, go to bigger pots of funding. But yeah, I guess if it was about, if that question was about the journal in specific, then that's how we make sure that it's all open access. I mean, we, would, we wouldn't put up anything that, we would never put up a paywall uh, anyway. We would just stop other than um, put up a paywall, I think. So, yeah, I, I don't, yeah. I, I, you know, like um, I, I, one of the libraries we're partnering with came and did a talk on the m ridiculous profit margins like Elsevier and Scopus take, you know, it's like 70% or something of, of, you know, so actually it doesn't really cost that much to be open access, I don't think. My eyes just went open because um, one of the main comments I usually hear when I go to these talks, it's it's so expensive to be open access. So that's a, my brain just went ding, ding, ding. Um, Are there any other questions? Maybe there's one more in the from a part. Yeah, Malvika, go ahead. No, let's, let's finish the from, from a part. I'm always an additional question. <laughs> um, there's one more. Uh, GitHub is not commonly used by people in my field. Uh, there aren't any commonly used open source platforms in this person's field. How can we direct people to our project in order to get comments and input on how? I think that might, that question might have been for previous speakers. Um, oh, right. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> so, we can we can definitely comment on that on the Slack. Vincent, maybe you ask your question. Yeah, thank you very much for the talk. Very uh, quick question. You said you at your journal you're putting people before the actual papers. So I if I don't know if that's the case now, but if you get a lot of people who want to write papers for your journal, how do you go about and select the ones that will end up in a certain issue? Is is there a process already, or can you speak to that a bit? Thank you. Yeah, I can. So um, it's a great question. Uh, in terms of a selection process, if someone has genuinely engaged in for in answering the questions on the application, then we will we will take them on board uh, basically. So, but um, you know, f the main thing is just we need to know can we 
support them in terms of funding uh, and and currently uh, you know so if we can and we'll, we'll, we'll work with people and we'll we'll try and whatever stage they're at and what you know some people come with um, just like a few a few lines of an idea and some people come with um, you know like half a manuscript so um, and in terms of how people then uh, so people get to the publishing stage at a very different point so it's a bit um, how do I say it, uh, it is a bit um, difficult to like weave things into a coherent issue uh, but the, the idea is that we we try and um, once people are ready we try and publish as soon as possible uh, as, as possible and we'll try and group similar themed articles together in an issue in the first issue we had a call for articles which was good in the second issue we had just people because we'd had more advertising people would start to apply and now we've just we, we've got like you know we've got enough people for like three two or three issues currently writing um so yeah it is um yeah it's, it's very much there's no like uh it's very rigid structure it's all about when is someone ready <laughs> who is ready with them and uh you know um basically that yeah thank you I will ask my question very quickly. Thank you, Sohail. It, it was really amazing because you also covered what it means to produce knowledge. And for a long time, we have really placed all our faith on open access publication, not open access, sorry, that's that slip of tongue, just the papers in high impact factor journals. It's really refreshing to see how you're promoting different artifacts of knowledge. Have you experienced resistance from other journal? Have they tried to say why you're doing this or this is not a good way to go? Yes, absolutely. And um, so very interesting. So as, as we as we started out, I, I started to arrange some meetings with um, potentially what I thought was uh, supportive uh, uh, journals. And some journals who were established were very supportive of our agenda. But some, I had a meeting with them. I talked about what we were doing and they were like, you're just creating a magazine. Or they were like, oh, um, you, you won't be able to survive. You can't pay people for this. Uh, so we, we did get a lot of resistance and resistance from people who I thought would be supportive. Um, but I think that means that we're probably doing something good uh, in the sense that if people are um yeah so we so just to be clear we have had su su support and 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 there are people for instance who are reviewers who are mentors who are uh, sitting on the boards of other uh, uh, uh sort of i would say more progressive journals but then some journals were um slightly offended i think and uh even like with some, you know, I've, I've, I've people in universities, like the idea of um, like we published a poem last issue, the idea of, and it's still something we're working through. It's like, it's art, it's knowledge. It's, it's really essential to get it out there and recognize and valued. Um, do you, we, we peer reviewed a, a poem and that was an interesting process. And like, um, you know, and this poem's got a DOI number and people can, you know, look, it, it, so it's just interesting to, we're working through these things as well. I think there is some skepticism uh, associated with them, but I, you know, I think it's so important to make it work. I think we have one more question from Islam Macha. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question regarding the publishing of poetry. First of all, thank you for, for this great, great talk and for this wonderful website. Um, and when you say publishing uh, poems, are you talking poems about uh, a specific domain or just um, which do domain of poetry are you talking about? So we are, our um, journal has a theme of uh, talking about racial health inequalities and knowledge production. So if anything in any medium, speaks to that and shares knowledge around that then we will uh uh consider it and, and and try and support it and try and make it make it happen okay awesome <laughs> all right <Cool>. thank you <laughs> no no worries yeah i think um yeah 
we've had like uh there's a there's a fable there's creative writing it's really and like i genuinely i use this for instance in my teaching i use the the, the poem we published i use that in my teaching because it tells you so much about um power dynamics in global health that particular one uh it was it's about someone's experience of uh, migrating and then teaching in another institution not really having their um their theories their experience um uh accepted and valued because it's coming from an, a, a, another country um so yeah i think it's um yeah so we do and i think it's really worth it and worthwhile yeah thank you so much I'll hand over back to Tash then. Thank you, Sohail. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the presenters. We had three wonderful um, talks. Um, it was really amazing. Um, we had a couple of questions that were very intriguing. I do have a question, but I think we are out of time, so I would <laughs> skip that. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining today's session. Um, just a comment from Malvika, generally. So if you like the breakout rooms, but you think the 15 minute discussion was short, I would like to have longer talk on any of the topics that we have discussed, either today or in previous sessions. You might be able uh, to have that if you join the inform informal session. So we have one coming up tomorrow at um, 4 p.m. UTC. Uh, and then we are going to share that more in the Slack channel. Uh, we are over time, so I would like to end the call by stopping the recording. And I will say once again, thank you everyone for joining.